Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. You are cordially invited to a podcast where everyone wants to podcast the podcast. No. Except the podcast. <laughs> Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yes. Six. <laughs> Hi, I'm a classically, vintagely sleep-deprived Griffin Newman. I'm a classically, vintagely irritated immediately David Sims. And this is one for the record books. Uh-huh. Ladies and gentlemen, what's that? Do you hear it in the wind? <laughs> He's always crazy. He's always crazier when he's like this. There's a storm a brewing. What's that in the horizon? It's no guest. He hasn't been sleeping. A no new one's seen the movie. miniseries. <laughs> yep. Uh huh. Da 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 da. Riding into town. A new miniseries. Yeah, it's exciting. You sound thrilled. It's exciting. <laughs> this, of course, is a podcast called. Blank check. We are hashtag the two friends. It's a competitive advantage. We're the only friends who host a podcast together. That's right. There are married people who host a podcast together. But we're the only friends. The yeah. only two friends. That's that's the other the thing. The only two friends. And some, you know, I think this movie proves that a good relationship, a good romantic relationship, a good marriage also requires an element of friendship. But look. You want to get married? Maybe. Okay, but also then we'd lose our advantage because I feel like we we keep it so simple, so pure. We could be the two husbands. Yeah. I think. Uh, how quickly do you think we would get divorced? <laughs> Removing the fact that we have no sexual chemistry together, which is an issue. An honestly. issue. I'm going to complain. I, about I'll say it. this: not insurmountable, but an issue. It's an issue. I mean, um, I tend to really suffer through and stick relationships out. In my history. Okay. So I feel like things would have to get real bad. But you... That's a challenge to me. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. You would rise to that. I like, think yeah. I would rise to that. Um, uh, people get tired of me very fast. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. It, it is astounding how quickly and strongly people can grow to resent my existence. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Um, anyway, of course, this is a podcast about our relationships. Um, yes. Yeah. Sorry. No, our relationships with the movies, filmographies, <laughs> directors who have massive success early on their career and given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy pattern projects they want. Sometimes they clear and sometimes they bounce baby. I thought this was a podcast about relationships. I, that was a misdirect, Ben. Uh. I was joshing producer Ben. I was just kidding, Ben Dooser. Yeah. I was goofing around. Sure. Doer Ben. Hey, you know, I was making a silly Sims on Reddit. Poet Laureate made a comment saying, I did. I was actually about to bring this up. <laughs> Fine, film critic. He's kind of, he's Lewis. kind of moved past this bit. White Hot Benny, soaking with Benny. Yeah. Dirt Bike Benny. Right, David? I think that we could stand to not do it every episode. I've thought about Peter. it. Or we could just do like a few names every episode. What if we do an October Madness bracket? <laughs> oh, God. To pick the one nickname and people can choose between the meat lover. Uh-huh. The fart detective. Yeah. The fuck master. They cannot vote for Professor Crespi. And they well, that's what they'll do. Just like how they've been voting for the March Madness. They're going to vote for the name that I don't want. Something that sure. happened six months ago at the time oh, that yeah. this episode's coming out. Oh, God. Yeah. We should acknowledge, just because this is topical. Oh, yeah. I can't. I'm so shocked that Nancy Myers is the winner of the tournament. We're doing that next. And here's another thing that's right... Top of the headlines in the news right now when this episode's coming out. You have graduated certain tolls over the course of different <laughs> researchers. Producer Ben. Kenobi. Kylo Ben. I can't wait for you to just be like, the ben Dow's save, up eight points. Like, save just anything. insert that later. <laughs> Alien Ben's with a dollar sign. Yeah. Warhaz. Purdue Bane. Ben 19, the final maker. Save anything, dot, dot, dot. Maybe it's just the miniseries names, too. Because that's like, at least points back to the archive. Robo but the Hans, problem with the miniseries names Benglish. is that Especially if we do like a shorter miniseries, like right. a Brad Bird. Sure. Yeah. It's like we just added a whole name for like six episodes. Mr. Ben you know? and so like it can really pile up on us. Here's another thing. I'm gonna throw out a real shocker. I genuinely hate doing them now. <laughs> oh my god. Yes. <laughs> so why do you 
do that? Why are we doing it's this? It's the part of the podcast that stresses me out the most. I feel right. like I genuinely can't remember like, them when anymore. When we have a guest on that's like new to the show yeah. and that we respect, oh. I I will think about the fact that we're going to have to do the fucking names like the day before. Like I don't even think about it like just when it comes up. I've been like God, now we have to do that. And I shit. also, I used to be like, this is a classic Griff bit. They're going to be annoyed. They're going to respect me less, but it'll be funnier later. Yeah. I don't even find it funnier later now. Right. And I've thought about what if you write them all down so you can do them all really quickly and just get out of the way and not have to struggle to remember. But I also feel like at that point, what's, what, why even, you know? Yeah. yeah. If they're that formalized. I, I, I've been kind of waiting to broach this topic. I'm glad we're doing it on the podcast. This is, of course, a podcast about our podcast. This is a podcast <laughs> in which we discuss <laughs> things we do on this podcast and whether or not to continue to doing them. No, I think, yeah, I think just just pick a name every time, you know? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, like one or two. Okay. Uh, producer Jacqueline. Okay. You said pick a name. Oh, no, I, I meant of oh the, of the, okay, great. So that's Ben. He's the producer. He's been with us since the beginning of this show, and yeah. uh, he has a lot of nicknames. And of course, we're talking about the films of Ang Lee. And that's a great introduction to <laughs> the, the great first... Taiwanese filmmaker, <laughs> Ang Lee. Who we have uh, a, a long debated possibility on blank check. Came very close to pulling the trigger a couple times. People don't Def. know how close we came. Def. Yeah, Ang Lee was in our sights. Yeah. And then he like looked around and we were like, <gasps> we were doing him next. And then we suddenly switched and got strategic. Uh, yeah. Um, but he's always been on our radar because he's a, a director who is incredibly versatile. Yeah. Has made a lot of different kinds of movies, worked in a lot mm -hmm. of genres, which we different like budget levels because it means that we get to kind of like, you know, it's not just one thing. Some big bounces, this isn't some a show where we like to do just one thing, like no. talk about like one bad prequel movie for 10. Ep like we don't Never. like to do stuff like that. We don't like to do bits. Never. <laughs> No. 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 Um, do it. Do it. Do it. Uh do it. Um he's also a two-time best director winner, which is a pretty rare at the Oscars, you're honor. Saying. Yes. Correct. Yes. He also has one best foreign film, which you have informed me goes to the country. It goes which to is Taiwan. Some fucking rank bullshit. A three-time nominee. Uh, in that category, his films are. But imagine, he, he won one time. Imagine if Best Picture worked that way too, where like Shape of Water wins, and then Trump is like, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> "It's for me. Get me over here." <laughs> that's that's a, a good point. What um, if our economy was based on all the Oscars being stored in the National Reserve? <laughs> He's great. He's I'm gonna get you off this bit. So <laughs> he's also one one thing that's interesting about him, he's won two Golden Bears, the Berlin Film Festival, wow. and two Golden Lions at the Venice Film Festival. Which for any director to win two of yeah. those is unusual. He's won the Berlin Film Festival both times he entered, same with Venice. And, so and, right now yes. it's like if Ang Lee enters a movie in that festival, everyone's like, I guess I guess it's the winner. Like, I also feel like most living filmmakers who are that fetid are also pretty esoteric. You know, like someone yes. like like right. like uh, Hanukkah like has won. No, exactly, you're right. Con right. like twice, three times. He's someone who can win the Golden Lion one year, and then he's like, I'm making an action movie where Will Smith like hunts his right. younger double, right? Like, there, which is the next movie. There making. is a versatility. Yeah. I'm going to make Hulk filmography. Right. right, right. And Hulk, I, you know, I was asked in an interview recently, what do you think is the ultimate blank check movie? And, and Hulk, Hulk kind of exemplifies everything I find fascinating. About the that's idea the of a reason we've film. always wanted to do them. That's the movie we would talk about. That we was talked about the... doing a one off when we weren't even sure if we were going to do Ang Lee ever as a miniseries. We were like, let's just do Hulk. Yeah. Hulk and the Hulk. Right. But no, our podcast is called. Do you even remember? <sighs> yes, it's called. Blank check with Griffin and David. Okay, nailed it. And this miniseries is called... Brookpod Mount Cast. Yes. I pulled it out of my butthole. Oh, boy. I thought I wasn't going to remember, but I did. Um, and today, we are doing a thing we haven't done since Minaj Night Shyamalan. Sure. We're doubling up. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. We haven't done this since, since I don't him? think so, right? I guess not. His first three films, Taiwanese, two of the three nominated for Best Foreign Film. Uh, a loose trilogy thematically that he calls the Father Knows Best trilogy, which share an actor playing fathers who know, one could argue, 
best. Well, but they don't really. It's a, it's an ironic mm, title. A little bit of a rhyme. There's sort of a rhyme oh, smirk to that title. Mater. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> mm. Uh, mm, yes. Mater. And uh, next week we're going to talk about Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, which that's was the his biggest that's crossover sort of the hit. We've coupled up the first two. The this, first one is very rarely seen. Essentially, we're, we're really talking about the wedding banquet at, with like a sort of uh, pushing hands intro. Yes. Uh, ben is pushing right. hands. We're right pushing now. hands into the beginning of an episode hands. that will mostly be about the wedding banquet, which is kind of the movie where he starts cooking. Yeah, because pushing hands and is a nice Eat, Drink, movie Man, Woman we'll is talk the about. movie where he starts cooking. That's true. Everyone starts cooking yeah. in that one. Um, especially that one daughter you don't expect to. Yeah, that's therein lies Spoiler alert. a twist. <laughs> but uh, no, Pushing Hands is a nice movie that I think we would struggle to maybe do a whole episode on. It would kind of probably be like our following episode, which after 20 minutes, we're kind of just like, hey, what's up with you? Yeah. Um, so we're going to... Ding gonna... dong! Oh. Ding dong! We just started. All, All right. right. Fine, I'll get the... I know. Oh, yeah. No, I'm glad you're objecting because you would hate if we were doing ding dongs in the first 10 minutes of the episode. Uh, get the door. Get the door. Creek. The door. Master Frodo. Uh, is this Samwise Gamgee? What, you know me? Uh, yes, 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 you're small. You're very famous. Well, then you must man. know my friend Master Frodo. Well, Have yeah, you seen you're Master always Frodo talking anywhere? About him. No, I haven't seen him since about 2003. Didn't he? Where did he, he go? And I I don't know. I haven't seen him since 2003 either. <laughs> okay. I think he got on a boat with Bilbo. So you're saying you're coming into <laughs> our podcast studio 15 years later after watching him get on a goddamn boat. Yeah, I came all the way from Middle Earth. I mean, it took me 15 years to get to this room. All right. Well, I was going room by room, just knocking on doors, ringing David, he's here. doorbells, well, all right. saying Master Frodo. Well, you made it in here. Master Frodo ain't here. Oh, God. Okay. On to the next room. Well, it, wait. Hang on a second. Is that it? Well, I have a very specific issue that I thought only Master Frodo could solve, and so I have to keep on ringing doorbells until I can get an answer from Master Frodo. There's no way you could help me. Well, just, I don't like you, and you've, for some reason, really touched a nerve with me. me. You're really pushing my buttons. I'm a good friend. I'm a kind man. I still, just, the the circumstances of your situation are so sympathetic that I guess I'll offer to help. So at least tell me, you know, what's up. This one issue so esoteric, there's no way you would be able to help me. I just, and again, I want to make this clear. For some reason, you're really getting on my last nerve. It's uh, always hey, been hey, true. Hey, okay. Hey, chill. Okay. I will ask. Chill. I will ask. But I do want to help. Like, you know, on paper, does that make sense? Master David? Yeah. I have a problem. Okay. My feet are just too hairy. <sighs> okay. Well, David. For some reason, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. Well, David, yeah. do you think you could suggest something to I'm our leave. friend I Sam? assume you have no response. We've been on this. All right, look. I'm walking Sam, out the Sam, door. What? Just hold on for one second. Master David. Um, You've never listened to the show, it's, it seems. because No, I've I, listened. I've listened. I'm a big fan. I'm blanking. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you. Your comments um, was a contact. Then right? maybe you've heard me talk about the amazing eye shave from get amazing shave that I get from my Dollar Shave Club razor. Now, I use it on my face. Yes, right. But it's a razor. It shaves hair very effectively. So maybe you want to, uh, you know, get some hand, get your get your little hobbit hands on some uh, Dollar Shave Club products. Okay, so fine. I can order a razor, Master David. But but a dry shave will cause so much damage to the skin of my feet. It'll be no good. Let me walk out no, this door. No, no, no. They've got products for your hair, your face, your skin, your shower. What? Everything shave you butter? need. And it's the... Yeah, shave butter, butt wipes. Wait a second. Replacement cartridges. Wait a second. Body cleanser. Wait a second. Uh, okay, I'm waiting. You're telling me they could solve my stinky butt? I'm, I am i didn't even want I to ask. I daren't even ask my you second got some swampy conundrum. Mordor butt. I have a Mordor butt. <laughs> well. My butthole looks like the eye of Sauron. If you join the Dollar Shave Club. so long gone unwiped. All right. <laughs> it burns like the eye of Sauron. Uh, you don't have to go to the store, which I assume is, is far away in Middle Earth. More like the you. brown eye of Sauron. You know what I'm saying? Master David. <laughs> uh, you can give gift memberships to your fellow members of the fellowship. Mary Pippin. It, all those friendly folks. You can give them e-gift cards. You can cover all your holiday shopping with Dollar Shave Club. 
You say Hobbit Day shopping? Um, yeah, uh, Hobbit, Hobbit Day, Day shopping. shopping. Uh, so here's a great way to try a bunch of Dollar Shave Club's products. For just five bucks, you can get the Daily Essential Starter Set. It comes with body cleanser, one wipe Charlie's, their amazing butt wipes, their world famous shave butter, and their best razor, the Six Blade Executive. Keep the blades coming for a few more bucks a month and add in shampoo, toothpaste, or anything else you need. I must find this promo code. I shall travel all the way nope, to Mount no, no, Doom. No, no, the no, only no, way no. I can find this promo ben, code. grab him. Literally grab hey. him. Okay. You can check it all out at dollarshaveclub.com slash check. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash check. Okay, so check in dot com and then check that you typed it incorrectly. You fool of a toque. That's a different one, isn't it? <laughs> it's just go to dollarshaveclub.com slash check. Oh, well then off I all right, shall get go. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Yeah. Go. All right. Can I say something? Yeah. That guy's butt reeked. I mean, he's from the fantasy world. You smell it they all the way wash. from over here. Yeah, and he's also having second breakfast all the time. You know what I'm mm, saying? That's a good point. Does I mean some real damage on your gastrointestinal tract? Um, so so far we've uh, introduced the name of the mini series, right. talked about our love lives and what would happen if we were married. So we're talking about two films today. Uh, we're talking about the opening two films in the career of one Ang Lee, the great Taiwanese filmmaker, a man who originally wanted to be an actor. Is that true? Yes. I didn't know that. And was so overcome with stage fright. He felt like he didn't have it. Interesting. He was so in love he with drama seem... and film at that point. Yeah. That he went like, well, now I just got to move parallel. Well, he does seem like kind of a timid guy anytime he's yep. like accepting an award. He always seems very like sort of softly spoken and lovely. Very much Which so. is funny because his reputation as a director is like... You know, a really like a uh, smart, forceful guy exactly. who will like get exactly tell you exactly what he wants and uh, Do- doesn't mince words. Uh, but doesn't I, mince words. But I yes. think he's not. Uh, you know, he he's not a hothead. No, no, he's he, no right. Um, he's, he seems to be very. I remember when he won. It may have been a BAFTA for Brokeback Mountain. I just okay. remember that Kate Winslet was presenting. I uh-huh. think it was at the BAFTAs, and when it was him. You could tell how genuinely happy she was. Like she, yeah. like she screamed with delight and like gave him a big hug and like you know because they work together on sense. Sure, and he and he makes very uh, empathetic films. Yes, yes. Um, but he uh, goes to NYU. Uh, well, uh, excuse me. Oh, okay, okay. He was okay. born in Taiwan. Oh, we're going all the way back. Well, long time ago in a galaxy. The year was nineteen fifty four. His parents had moved from mainland China to Taiwan after the Chinese Civil War. Okay. Uh, he grew up uh, in a, he went to school. His dad was the principal. I think his parents were very like, yeah, you know, you're going to get yourself an That education. does sound like a plot of an early angle. It, it does. His father knows best. Uh, he failed to get into uh, university in Taiwan, which is like, okay. you have to take some sort of a, a unified test. At least back then you did. And he failed it twice. To the disappointment of his father, according to Wikipedia. Yeah. Maybe his father wrote this <laughs> Wikipedia entry. So Amer- He's never gotten over it. American film school was kind of out of necessity. Well, I always assumed it was first, like a strategic move. First, he went to a national arts, the National Arts School in Taiwan, which okay. is, uh, which sounds, I mean, it sounds pretty good to me, but I yeah. guess his dad was like, well, you know, uh, but uh, he, so he, he wanted, got, his dad wanted him to go to principal college. Uh, exactly. He got into uh, film there. He got mm. into drama. He saw Ingmar Bergman's film, The Virgin Spring. He okay. has talks about a lot how much Ingmar Bergman was a big deal to him. Almost like that film was, I don't know, a Rosetta Stone? <laughs> uh, he did his mandatory military there was a service. there he wanted to sort of replicate. He was in the Navy. It, it sort of functioned as an urtext for his career. Is that what you're saying? Sure. And then he went to the University of Illinois. What? And completed his bachelor degree okay. in theater. He wanted to be an actor, like you said. Thank you. But he struggled with um, English. He uh-huh. was still he was still like a, a, a weak English speaker at yeah. that point. He meets his wife, Jane Lynn. Cool. Who he's still married to, who's like a Humble microbiologist. Uh, and um, enrolls at Tisch. Uh-huh. For graduate? Gets an, yeah, gets an right. MFA. Yeah. Hangs out with Spike Lee. <laughs> a contemporary. He worked on Spike Lee's thesis films, uh, Joe's Bedside Barbershop. Yeah. And uh, he does a short film. His thesis film is called Fine Line. Okay. Which apparently aired on PBS. And I then was adapted into the uh, film studio Fine Line Features. 
Of course. Thank you. Um, yeah, it became that Hootie and the Blowfish song. Do you have in this giant leather-bound volume of context on Ang Lee's career that you're currently reading from, do you know, uh, can you look up when he crosses paths with James Seamus? Because that becomes the key collaborator. I know. That's from the a, very beginning. I know. It's a good point. Like Because wh- wh- it's interesting that Seamus, Seamus, I believe, was not an NYU guy. Yeah, there's very little on I'm sure if I do pr- some proper research, I can find out. You know, James Seamus, is, he's a Jew from Michigan. Right. I think quietly the most interesting figure in the last 20 years of independent film. Right, because he was such a, a big part of Focus Features, which was... Right, he's like the one guy who's uh, like as much know, of an artist as he is like a studio a head. Uh, yeah. He had a production company with Ted Hope that was <laughs> combined with some other companies to form Focus Features, and then he became the guy there. And he was like acquiring films, green lighting films, working at distribution deals for other films and also writing Ang Lee films that like spanned like genres. Like he's this real. I know I mean, he obviously, yes, you have to talk about James Seamus when you talk about Ang Lee because he literally co-wrote Pushing Hands, his first movie. Right. And I, I maybe they just met in New York when uh, Ang Lee was at Tish. I don't know. But all yeah. I know is that he submits, Ang Lee submits Pushing Hands and The Wedding Banquet, two scripts. Mm-hmm. to a competition sponsored by the Taiwanese government. Okay. They came in first and second. Jeez. So, uh, like, some promoter in Taiwan mm-hmm. is like, why don't you make Pushing Hands? Like, you, okay. why don't that you do like that? That seems like the easier I'll, first I'll, I'll invest film. in this sure. movie, and uh, you, can, uh, you can put this together. So we're going to talk about that first. We're going to talk about Pushing Hands. Yes. So the things that unite these two films, they are both set... In the United States. True. They are foreign language films about Taiwanese people. Are both in New York? Uh, no, because... I had a hard time figuring out where Pushing Hands was. Pushing Hands is in, like, this New York suburbs. It's, right, okay. I mean, it's not in the Because they go the into city. the city later yeah. in the film. Yeah. Okay. Set in the suburbs. Uh, wedding banquets in New York proper. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's in the fucking village, man. Yes. Uh, oh, p- please. Like, downtown Griffey Nooms doesn't know that. All right. Um... And and so they're interesting foreign language films set in New York City with mixed casts. Starring this uh, sort of respected but essentially retired Taiwanese mm-hmm. actor who Ang Lee kind of like drafts out of retirement. Who gives a trilogy, like a triptych of great performances as yes, three different types of fathers. Yes, it, that's what I like about it the most is he's the different in every one. Very different His in every one. His name is Si Hung Lung. Yeah. He's in this one. I feel like he's at his most sort of confused. Mm-hmm. And in the second one, he's in Wedding Banquet. He's most sort of like rigid, traditional right. Chinese father. And the third one, and he's in the trying third one, to learn. Right. In the third one, yeah. he's kind of got a foot in each and he's, he's you know, he's but, cooking. But pushing hands, he's he's pretty stoic. He's pretty silent. Yes. And this is a quieter movie. Yes. There's less dialogue. Yeah. Uh, if someone, if I was asked, like, how do you define, like, great acting? Like, wh- what do you look for as sort of, like, an argument for someone being a great actor rather than someone who gave, like, one great performance? Yeah. I would say, like, look at these three movies because here's a guy who's, like, not transforming himself, right? Right. Not changing his voice or his physical appearance in any dramatic way. Okay. Is playing three characters that on paper look fairly similar and they are three completely recognizably different human beings sure you know through very subtle shifts of characterization go on the opening scene of pushing hands i think is the highlight of the movie it is it kind of tells you what the movie is and then i think it's a nice enough movie but it does kind of just repeat itself but it is one of those movies where you're like the first 10 minutes function as a short film that gets everything the entire film is trying to say done go on economically lay them out for me the opening sequence which is largely silent. Yep. We start with this man practicing what seems to be sort of martial arts stretches, right? Yes, his name is Mr. Chu. Right. He's doing Tai Chi. Right. He's pushing hands. Yes. That's what that's what the move is called. You know, uh, he's pushing his hands through the air. I guess later that's no, the move no. the sun teaches. Pushing hands is something else, but it's okay. Carry on. The sun says later in pushing the Pushing hands is when you can push someone across, like when it's like an offensive move, you know? Okay. Anyway. You know, where like you yield and then like you sort of like turn it against them. Sure. But it's sort of a. Okay. But a can metaphor. I say this? Mm-hmm. And will you correct me on this? Mm. At the opening of the film, he is 
pushing his hands through the air. Sure. Literally. Okay, I'm, so, I'm the, sort of miming so the movie opens pushing hands, mm-hmm. and... Uh huh. He's very silently and sort of methodically yeah. practicing. It's, it's very relaxing and to watch these moves. Yeah. And then I feel like we cut. He seems kind of chilled out. Right. Yeah. We cut to middle-aged white woman. Uh, that's middle-aged. I mean, she's uh, probably in her. What do you think? Late thirties, early forties. Right. And people yeah. die about fifty-one. I think. Right. <laughs> Jesus, that's depressing. I'm almost done. This movie's set medieval times, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Huh? Um, sitting at her computer. Clearly, kind of like struggling with some writer's block. Played by uh, it's Martha, and she's played by Deb Snyder, who I don't know if you know this. That is the name of uh, Zack Snyder's wife and producing partner. That's true, but this is not Zack Snyder's wife. So I went to this Deb Snyder's IMDb page to figure out what else she had done, and right. all the news stories that were linked to her about, IMDb page yeah. were about Justice League. <laughs> Fair enough. So I spent. 45 minutes trying to figure out what her connection to Justice League was. Right. And then for a second, I thought she was Zack Snyder's very young mother. She's not. She's not. She's, a she's just some lady. I mean, hey, she's hey, fine. Hey, what do you, what would she's you say? She's not great in this movie. Hey, I would say actually she's sort of a flaw. I'd say movie. she's kind of a deterrent. <laughs> yeah, she's sort of an issue. She's a little bit of a weight around the neck. Because uh, the son, uh, Alex, played by Bo Z. Wang, uh-huh. like he's pretty good. I think he's okay. I think this is a performance that is uh, handicapped by his lack of comfort with the English language. Yes. Because this character is clearly supposed to be more fluent than he is as an actor. Interesting. You presume that. I know what you're saying. If, if he is married to an American woman, raising a child in English, nationalized, has been here for presumably at least a decade, he would have more agility with the language than. The character seems to. And I find that the scenes in which he's acting uh, in his native language, he seems a lot more physically relaxed. Fair Versus enough. when he's speaking in English, he seems a little tense, like he's like, am I fucking this up? Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think he's half good. I think she's not very good at all. No. And the father's great. The father's like amazing. He's sort of, he's sort of showing them all up. Right. You know, unintentional. So this opening sequence is him pushing hands, and that's the official term of what he's doing, and her sort of struggling with writer's block, and then through editing, silently, you start to realize that they're in the same right. space, right. colliding. And then they do sort of collide. Right, and and she kind of is, is like, he's this nuisance. His presence in her home just kind of stresses her out. Right, she has married his son. Yes. And now he has to live uh, there... Because yes. his wife died mm-hmm. during the Cultural Revolution, I think. Like, there, there was some sort of, like, um, you know, when Alex was a kid, when the son sure. was a kid. Some sort of, like, government clash and, yeah. like, the wife ends up dying. And so there's a lot of, like, family guilt that's rooted in, like, But that's the also Chinese, a sort of cultural uh, tradition dissident. of keeping your family under one roof. The, sure. the sort of caring for the elders in a way... Us, but, us but he's a pain in the ass. Oh, this guy. Uh, oh, he's always putting side. his Tai Chi where her typewriter should be. I mean, literally, that's, that's sort of like the plot of the movie. That's pretty much what's going on here. And, and she kind of... I, I feel like she's playing so prickly from the beginning yeah she's that you're, you're just, just like, not on her this side guy a fucking chance. yeah you're like are you kidding me this guy came all the way from china like he's uh so out of water here that, right like him going for a walk is stressful for the whole family he's literally silent in a corner moving very slowly and she's like can you fucking keep it i down know it's not there? right it's not like he's <laughs> like break dancing like he's putting cardboard down and like spinning on his head like he's pretty quiet <laughs> and uh yeah yes you know maybe like uh, he keeps saying like you should really like i should teach you some more tai chi so you could chill out yeah and he's trying to say it in a nice way and she's like i don't even want to fucking talk and i'm to like this guy. take him up on it i mean yeah. i think honestly because he seems calmer he's her, got he's got his you know his right. fish out of water but, like issues, her friend but. comes over and is like how's grandpa doing and she's like don't even oh my god yeah yeah, she sucks. I, I'm realizing that she was probably my... The other hang-up I have with this movie is just that it doesn't look that good. It's no. the only Ang Lee movie that doesn't look very good. Even by the wedding banquet, 
It's the, a good looking movie. It's a gorgeous movie with yeah. like great compositions and sense yeah. of space and all this. This one is like uh, it's a it's a it's a good first movie. This feels like a thesis film. Yeah. This feels like a long short film. We also watched it admittedly in like a less than ideal transfer. I think the other two films have been preserved better. Yeah, this one I watched on Amazon Prime. It was streaming company, for free. Uh huh. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it definitely had that loveless vibe of like this was a VHS put on. a Yeah, did site. someone just transfer a VHS? Right. Um, and maybe they did. Maybe they did. Um, but it it has certain good sequences. It has certain good moments. But the film is kind of repetitive of just them trying to figure out this this balance you know the son feeling this obligation you don't understand in my culture we don't abandon our parents like this i need to be there for him and the wife who is uh very stressed out about the reviews that her book is going to get and the pressure to write a second book concurrently right i forgot about that right but she's just constantly there's no vulnerability this character i find in how it's played you know yeah uh, it's not that i cannot uh uh care for someone who is stressed out in a way that yeah. makes them unpleasant i get why she's stressed out you do but but it, everything's played at such a like reactionary kind of fever pitch i right the good stuff in pushing hands is the dad hanging out with mrs chen the widow right. who's the cooking instructor at like the community center and like their relationship is nice, you know. I like good anything. Good stuff is Mr. Chen when he gets the job at the restaurant. Like yeah. all that shit's good, and he works really slowly and methodically. And the boss wants to fire him, and he just like oh, yeah. stands right. his ground, hey, man. and then literally stands his ground. There's right. this great extended <laughs> sequence. He, yes, he like pushes him across the room, essentially. Right, but he's also like, if you want me out of here, try to get me out of right, here. Right, and then it right. just becomes an immovable force. He becomes like Amen. planted in the ground and you have like six cops who get reported in. And he sends like thugs in to try to like knock him down and the guy won't move. Fun. It's all very <laughs> fun. Everything that happens, you're like, I get it. It's I get a it. culture you get clash. It. Even though we're talking about this movie as a trifle. Yes. It won some awards. It won some awards. It was feted. Yeah. It's like a solid debut. I mean, I yeah. think the movie looks worse because we know that literally every literally film it, five he's made minutes. After that. Also, like five minutes from now, we're going to talk about the wedding banquet, which, which is, is good, right? Significantly yeah. better. Right. And it's only made a year later, so it's like, oh, he, you know, because like, uh, but what's it called? Praying with anger to yeah. wide awake to six sense is sure. like a near ten year arc, <laughs> right? And like the improvement is gradual and then sudden. Right. Whereas this is like, he made one movie. It's pretty good. A year later, he made another movie. It was amazing. A year later, he made another movie. It was better. Like, right. you know, it's right. sort of like. He he has such a, an accelerated growth rate here. Which and then we a year later, a guy like this. He did Sense and Sensibility. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a while where we've covered a lot of guys who have debut films that are pretty professional and polished, even if their later films get better. Sure. This kind of like Piranha 2. Yeah, we haven't had it probably praying with since anger. the Piranha 2 Like here days. you're watching a real kind of first draft film. Yeah. Where if you saw this at a festival, you'd be like, this guy might be a good director someday. There's some moments that are really fucking well observed in this. Movie's not great, but there's some really good stuff. So I think if you saw right. this as a first film, you'd probably give it a little more praise because of the potential you sensed. Agreed. But if you're watching The Wedding Banquet, like literally – Five minutes after you finish watching Pushing Hands, as I do, you're like, okay, well, forget about. Pushing I'm never going to think about go. Pushing Hands shit. ever again. Uh, how does it end? Pushing Hands ends with. Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> no, I don't think. I guess he moves out. He, he gets. Moves out. He gets with the lady. He he goes on a walk with the lady. Yeah, he says he knows he wants the wife wants him out. Yeah. He kind of starts crying. Yeah. He's good. Let's talk about the wedding banquet. Yeah, let's talk oh, about actually, the wedding banquet. What? No. We're going to play the box office game. Oh, great. My friend. What I was going to say, though, is like you look at like praying with anger, I think is like not very good at all. Right? Not very professional. No, it's a, it's a, it's a bad movie with a little hint of promise. Right. Yes. Then Wide Awake. It is an amateurish film. Right. Wide Awake is like. A mediocre film that I have a soft spot for. It's a bad for. film that's at least competently made. It's very polished. Yes. Like, it's very, like, professionally produced, and it has one incredible joke. It has one of the greatest jokes of all time. Shut up. Quiet. <laughs> the movie's called Wide Awake. You need a, a prod. 
<laughs> shock him. He's barely awake. Quiet. He's so tired. He's all right, all right, all right. Sh- shut up. Shut up. But then Sixth Sense, you're like, where the fuck did this come from? Uh, exactly, yes. Uh, this, no. These three films, it's a more traditional build where you're just seeing him going like, okay, it's I got that It's a 45 degree away. angle, essentially. Yes. It's just sort of like, doop, doop, doop. Yeah. Right, okay, so box office. This movie must have burned it up. <laughs> so this movie, the reason this is interesting yeah. is it didn't come out in America <laughs> until after oh, right. Wedding Banquet and Eat, Drink, Man, And Woman. it was like, here's the first film from right. It was the advertised new. as from the director of The Wedding Banquet the international and international sensation, Woman. yeah. So it comes out in June 1995. Okay. Not long before Sense and Sensibility. You know? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, it made a hundred and fifty-two <laughs> million thousand dollars. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, so, so it comes out right in the middle of summer blockbuster season. Number one. Uh huh. Is a movie we've talked about on this podcast. Have you've, we covered it or just no, talked about it? We've talked about it. Uh, what are you going to say? Children's you, film. The I saw it in film. theaters. You probably did too. Casper. <laughs> this is fast. <laughs> It's fast. It's weird. <laughs> he got that. <laughs> Super weird. In its second weekend, it's made $38 million. It makes 100 Yeah. One of the best American even. films of the 90s. Whew. Casper's a masterpiece. Silberling, is it? Don't at me. Silberling, our next miniseries. No. Number two. A fine American director. Number Brad two Silberling. is one of the, the better and more underrated films in like the very big uh, filmography of a, a very big deal director. Well, that's weird because... Casper, a spirited beginning no. wouldn't have come out at the same time as the first Casper. Not Casper-er. talking about that. But you said one of the best and most underrated films of the of 90s. A, it's a different And that was direct-to-video. I said so I of a director. Know. Right. Certain director who right, has made... Right, you said director-to-video, which was Casper, a spirited beginning, which was, of course, the prequel to Casper. I want to get through this box office game. It's a romance based on a famous book, like a hit book. Bridges of Madison County? Wow. Thank you. Good job. Have you seen it? No, I it's people a Clint like it, film, right? To be clear, great movie. Javier Bardem said that performance is is uh, yes, one of his he, favorite. He draws from, from uh, yeah. yeah that performance. It's yeah. a great movie. Um, number three mm-hmm. is a, just an action sequel, a big hit of the summer. Okay, but Another once again, Casper's Spirit of Beginning would not have been out. <laughs> Don't think that's an action movie. It's an action movie. It's a big sequel. It's one of the big movies of the of the summer. Yeah, it's a great movie. Number two, three. Oh, 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 is it, it's no, well, three. It's the third in the series. Is it Batman Forever? Nope. It's the third in the series. Is it the final? No, no. But it, there is a bit of a break after this one. Takes them a while to make the fourth one. Interesting. In a weird sort of way. Like, they probably should have made the fourth one pretty quickly. So would you say- th- this movie's good. Like- Does the fourth one happen in a different decade? Yeah. yeah. The fourth, the fourth one's, one's like 12 years later or something. Fourth one doesn't come out your phone until 2007, roughly something, something like, like that. that. I can't it's remember. It's an exactly. action film, huh? Does it? Is it a star vehicle? Yeah. Is it a pair of stars, or is there really kind of one person? It's one person, although I think uh, multiple people might have been billed above the title. No, they weren't. They were billed below the title. Star title, couple other stars. Die Hard with a Vengeance. Bryce above the title, Sam and, and Jeremy below. That's right. Right below? Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, a okay. good, it's a good movie. It is a good movie. I like that You know movie. what's not a good movie? Die Harder. Yeah. Live Free or Die Hard. Or Live Free or Die Hard. Oof. Or A Good Day Die Hard. I've never seen that one. Um, I haven't either. Four I just is, know it's not a good movie. Number four is the best picture winner of 1995. Uh, Braveheart? That's right. Cool. And number five is another movie we've talked about. I love this movie. Casper Spirit at Beginning. It's a good. Uh, you like this movie? No, you like this movie? No, no, the episode. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I thought Ben was praising this fine American action film. Remember when for a hundred and fiftieth episode we were like, "Give us ratings. We want to go top of the charts." Yeah. So stupid. The strategy we should have employed was making an episode this good. Of course. That's the way to get to top of the charts. People you have to make an episode this good. People won't be able to not like listen. AV Club. Split Cider. New, New York Times. <laughs> New Yorker's going to do a CNN. feature. Philip Roth is coming out of retirement to write a novel about this episode. I'm learning. Wow. Bob, Bob Mueller's investigating how this episode turned out so well. <laughs> we just got a subpoena from Congress? Was it Russian meddling? 
Americans couldn't have done an episode this good on their own. Weird. The Olympics are creating a podcast category for this episode. <laughs> Wait a second. I just checked my phone that you told me to turn off. Jesus just texted me, coming back to life, need to listen to that episode <laughs> in a physical realm. Fantastic. Yeah, number five is Crimson Tide. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yes? Or should I say, hams? You get so focused on the names of our sponsors. Let's look. It's an easy way in. The sounds they make. Hymns. You're talking about hymns? I am. You're talking about forhims.com? Guilty as charged. You're talking about the people who help men who are losing their hair? Mm -hmm. 66% by age 35. Yeah. And people, you know, they might notice that the hair's going away, but it's too late. Guy stuff. Should have gone to forhims.com. And I'm not going to let my fragile ego... Machismo get in the way. Sure. Oh, I don't want to have to go to the doctor. I don't want to have to talk to somebody. Oh, I got to go to a gas station. And get a weird pill. But no, get no. out of here. Forhims.com. It's a one stop shop for hair loss, skin care, sexual wellness for men. They connect you to real doctors. They give you medical grade solutions to treat hair loss, give you well known generic equivalents to name brand, brand prescriptions, and gets you, lets you keep your hair. You just go on the internet. You ever heard of it? Answer a few questions. Who, fine, who cares? Doctor reviews, prescribes you medicine, products get shipped directly to your door. You feel great. You look great. But what does this have to do with blank check? Oh. Our listeners get a trial month of hymns for just $5 today, right now, while supplies last. You can see the website for full details. Well, that's really convenient because otherwise it would have been really weird that we just started talking about hymns. Yeah, because we've never gone on weird tangents on this show. But before. now this dovetails in very nicely. No, it'd cost you hundreds if you went to the doctor. Hold or on, wait pharmacy. a second. Hey, guys, sorry. Uh, were you were you talking about for hymns? Yeah, we were talking about for hymns. Yeah, you just got to go yeah. to forhymns.com slash check. Ben is sitting back, nodding in approval. That is F O R H I M S dot com slash check. For hymns.com slash check, you can get a trial month of for hymns. Just five bucks. Hey, five bucks. You can afford that, Lost right? Supplies last. This is the perfect movie for us to laugh and joke about. This extremely sensitive, uh, <laughs> like wonderful romantic drama about a gay guy talking to his family and like, you know. Did you cry at the end of this movie? Um, I got I got kind of choked up at it. I, I was more impressed with it though. Like, you know, it could have been a, a real tearjerker. Uh-huh. It and also could have been a real goofballs McGill, and it could have been a real birdcage. Right. Right. I make this joke in the next episode, but very surprised this movie wasn't remade with like Tim Allen. No, exactly. It, yeah. No, no, exactly. And it's like instead of that, I was just like sort of blown away by how uh, reasonably and sort of mo you know quietly everything was handled at yeah. the end of the movie. Yes, and but it's, yes, I yeah. mean. It's, it's, a, the, it's uh, the next movie that really made me cry at the end, but th this one's, you know. The ending of this one weirdly hit me harder. Not to jump the gun, but there's something like, about what this film ends up building to, which is this is a movie that's based around deception, right? True. Like yes. a lot of and high a lot of those movies can be annoying. Where it's like you got to keep up a lie. There's a big lie, and then you know it's going to get revealed, and you're sort of dreading that part. You right. Know. And those movies tend to be very set piece based. You have the plot mechanics, you can hear the gears as they're working towards yeah. big blow up scenes, yeah. right? And this movie does the exact opposite, which is actually just play out the scenario. It doesn't okay. go for, like, big jokes, right, or big movements. It just no. kind of plays out the, like, slow repercussions right. of all the decisions these people are making. Like, let me do it. I'm going to do it in, like, yeah. you know, Tino. It's like uh, Wang Tung Gao mm -hmm. lives in the village with his partner, Simon. Right. He's, they are he's gay like men. A, a downtown Griffey Nooms type. They're downtown Griffey Nooms types. They're yeah. gay guys. Um, they're I think they're both out in terms of, like, to their friends Publicly? and their, you yes. know, right? Like, you know, right. they're. Uh, they live together, yada, yada, yada. Right. Um, well, we got one guy more of a conservative button-down businessman type, the other guy an out-there-on-the-streets activist. Um, yes, that's true. But they true. both seem pretty that's secure true. in Simon is, like, a part of ACT UP, and you see right. him campaigning, and yes. Wei Tung is, like, um, you know, like a, a lawyer or something, like, you know, business, I can't remember. He has, like, uh -huh. a good job, right? All that crap. Well, he's he, a landlord. Right, exactly. right, he's a real Thank estate you. guy. Yeah, come yeah, on. Sorry, central, sorry. central plot device of the film. Of course, sorry, yes. sorry. And uh, but you know what I'm saying is like he's he's making decent money. But he they is got a nice place. he is open enough yeah. that when he goes to check in on his tenant who is behind in her rent, she fully knows yes. the deal. She knows the name of his live-in boyfriend. Wait, wait. Right, Mei Chen's character. Right, she is a so, painter. 
Sure, sure, sure. But here's what you know. So yeah, he's this is his situation. His parents who live in Taiwan, mm-hmm. they're always like, "When are you gonna get married? Right. Are you gonna marry a nice lady?" Well, they, I want they a grandchild. They like hire a dating service to find him like a nice lady. Right. Uh, yeah, he has yeah, to pick yeah, her up yeah. from the airport, and then very quickly realizes that they're both being set up by their parents. She's yes. dating a white guy. Right. Her parents can't know. He's dating a white man. His parents can't know. And they end up having this nice, like, afternoon. I just like that scene ends up being like a bonding of the two of them being like, yeah, it sucks not I being know, able to be scene. in love with and, who you, you know, love. And when I'm watching that scene, I'm like, oh, is this the person that – are they both going to pretend to get married right. so it'll be bird cagey where yeah. it's like they're both balancing? No, no, no. She's just a one-off character. This movie sort of just has like an empathy for all of its characters enough that it's like, we're going to treat this character like a person and give her five minutes. Yeah, because she's the joke where he puts in these like outrageously demanding um, Right, she has to be an opera singer. She has to be tall. She has to be an opera singer. Right, she has to have uh, three have degrees. two PhDs, right. something like that. Right, she, he wants three PhDs and they're like, look, she only has two, Right, but we checked off every other box, which is funny. Um, speaks five languages. and but yep. um, But his parents finally announced they're coming. His father has, like, some sort of health crisis. Right. So there's, like, a little bit of worry around that. So they're coming. hmm And so he tells them, okay, uh, I'm with this woman, his mm-hmm. tenant, Weiwei, and we're going to get married. Because Weiwei can't pay her rent. And she can't seem to find a good relationship for herself. Yes. So he kind of goes, like, look, here's the deal. Scratch my back. I scratch yours. Right. Pretend to be my wife. That is the premise of the movie. Right. Now. Hijinks couldn't see. Exactly. They it could be very not. easy because it's essentially they're going to have this sham marriage, not just a sham marriage, but like a really big, extravagant Chinese wedding ceremony, you know, with all the uh, tassels. Because that's even the scene where you go like, here's the wind up. This would be two acts of a dumb film is like, they're like, let's get this over with, go to City Hall. Yeah. The parents are upset that they're not throwing a well, big wedding. Well, we'll get to that. That seems actually really good. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. Right. The parents are not into it. They want a real wedding that they can take pictures at, they can bring the invite the family to. There is a version of this movie where 60 of the 90 minutes... Are the wedding? Yeah, and yeah. it's just like shit happening at the wedding and everything yeah. going wrong and like, you know... Yeah. Before he has to make a big confession in front of everybody. Right, which is, that's not what this movie is at all. No. This movie is never exactly what you think it's going to be. And yet it is also, uh, like, nice culture clash comedy about a gay man coming out to his parents. Like, it is that. Right. But it just isn't in, in the way you think it's going to be, at I all. guess. Yes. It's a great movie. Agreed. It has one plot point that does 25 years-ish on uh, make you go, huh, um... Yeah. The sex scene. Agreed. The sex scene is weird. Um, but I I chalk that up more to, like, that's the one plot mechanic that kind of just clangs badly, you know? But like here's the thing. I get why they have to do that. Sure. It does feel like there's a better version of that scene. Right. I think there is a version of that scene where it doesn't feel like an assault. Uh, no, I do, too. I think that's what I'm saying. Which, in the of, movie, it kind of plays that way. That's the problem. And, and they, I, they don't really totally acknowledge that it was a sex scene with no consent given by him until later. It literally fades out on do, him going like, Ugh, he on. says no. Right. He, uh, like as yeah, they fade straight out. Straight up. Um, yeah. uh, but then later they kind of acknowledge that, but also they sort of brush it aside. Anyway, but I that's, also that's don't the one thing where you're like, that's oh. the only way you can get no, to that. No, it's not what that's not what that right. actually is. Right. Because the way that they address it later is that his boyfriend is like, yeah, I get shit happens, you know, whatever. Like, you know, so they should have just been like in close quarters for a long time. You know, they they're kind of, they're drunk. They've they just got married. Like they right. sort of like because the idea Cause of this movie the is their tradition. Them being naked in the bed is just like that's not, totally earned by yeah. this weird ceremony going on around exactly. them. The idea yeah. is this: the the tradition around them that they put around them in some ways to try and satisfy everyone. You know, it's right. pushing in tighter and tighter and like this is a movie They're very much pushing about hands. Spaces. I think that's the exact term. The official term is pushing hands. I think pushing hands is yeah. the exact term. Official term, David is typing in pushing hands to verify. That oh, that I was typing right in uh, assassins for hire. We should use ZipRecruiter. Re- yeah, I should. Yeah, that, that should be our next, the, the next ZipRecruiter ad if we do one is uh, me trying to find someone to kill you. And you thought our marriage would last. <laughs> you thought that you would be the one who could stick it out. Genuinely, let's get back to that for a second. Yeah. What would you bring to the marriage? 
I'm a real sweetheart. You are. You are a sweetheart. Because, like, for me, it's like I can bring a lot of, like, I'm good at, like, cooking and sort of keeping things running. Like Paying I'm, rent, not getting kicked out of your apartment. Well, I mean, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, I do it. I pay the rent. Yeah. I grouse about it. Yeah, you're more organized. Yeah, I'm a little more organized. I feel like I would provide some of the stability. Uh, yeah. What what are you bringing here? Because I'm I'm just guessing spice. that you're not bringing some oh a little spice. What is spice? Don't you just want to like uh like um be at home and like watch movies? And yeah, play that's with what toys? I like doing. Right. That's what yeah. I like doing. I like putting some hand candy in my mitts, some and, plastic hand candy, and you like watching uh, some talkies, e- eating um like the worst garbage food. Yeah, I'm an old garbage belly. Right, like ordering chicken tenders from the diner on Seamless yeah, or but something. Once again, I'm a sweetheart. Yeah, you are. Um, what do I add in a relationship? That's a good question. This is maybe the You're question saying, I should have asked right, myself. This, this question's cutting ago. a little too deep. <laughs> like, is it one of those like joke questions where you're like, what do I add? What? Huh. <laughs> like, Ben, what do you bring to a relationship? I think I have uh, a spirit for life. <laughs> Joie de vivre. Yeah. Uh, I think like I, I, like I walk in the room and it's just like things get brighter. Have you ever, I agree, one, I agree. Have you ever done um, speed dating, Ben? Like the, uh, where you like switch tables every five minutes Follow or whatever? questions, have you ever taken speed? Uh, no so, and yes. Yeah, pretty much how I expected that one to go. <laughs> so, the right. wedding banquet, a nominee for best foreign film at the Academy Awards. Yeah, and, and uh, actually I want to find out who it lost to because we brought that up at yeah. the, um, in the Eat, Drink, Man moment episode. We, we will bring that up. Um, it lost to, I think it's a, like a real, yeah, Belle Epoque. Yeah. Oh, which, yeah. No. No. It, this should have won. This should have won. But you know what? Uh, it's up against Farewell, My Concubine. Oh, weird. And uh, that also is like a very good movie that Should've like won. is a plausible yeah. winner. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the two Asian movies. film, a lot of that. Like cancel each other out, right. like I not to, yeah, that movie fucking about detours Oscar winners. or whatever it was called win. A lot of times, like yeah, I mean, you know, often a very middle of the road movie will well, win. But this is like a pretty fun movie. But like, he, but here's the thing to talk about, okay? Yeah, because now the rules have changed. Back then, not every Oscar voter was allowed to vote for best foreign film. No, you had to have seen the movies and all that. Yeah. And the way you had to have they seen were them was old. no. But do you know what they used to do? Go ahead. You used to have to go to an organized screening where you watched all five films in a row. Uh, yes. It okay, wasn't about right. screeners. So you had to be like, I have nothing to do on a Tuesday. Right. It was all like 80 year olds. And you'd was sit like... there and watch 10 hours of foreign films. Right, right. So usually the one that was just about like old people being old and the one that was like the least offensive would win. Yeah. Yeah. Things have changed. Times have, times have changed. The wedding banquet. Mm-hmm. Wait, so I, yeah, we talked about the basic setup. Right. Uh, he's got traditional parents. They are played by Si Hung Lung from the last movie. He plays Mr. Great Gao, nice. his dad. He's yeah. really good in this. Really fucking good. Because he's very vulnerable yeah. and like frail in some mm-hmm. ways, but also like you, I want his praise yes. in this movie. That that scene early on when they arrive and they, they have the like, the um, uh, Wei Wei does the sort of a calligraphy speech uh-huh. like where, where she's obviously like made sure to study calligraphy because she knows that's what uh, her new dad likes. I love and the training of the cooking too. It, like yeah. just but like watching him be satisfied yeah. is very rewarding even though it's not like he's like a big smile on his face or anything. He's just like quietly happy. He's yeah. also not playing a one dimensional grump so you feel not like his all. approval is attainable. Like weirdly, the most one-dimensional character is is Wei Tung, is the main character. Agreed, and only because like he's so often grumpy because he is at the center of yeah all this uh, scheming. You know? Right. Um, Mei Chen mm-hmm. plays Wei Wei, his his wife. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gua Ale plays his mother. She's so good. Uh, I mean, she I'm got an Independent Spirit nomination. Wrong. I know she's so fucking good. Um, can I can I throw out a a, a thing I found while looking up this film. Yeah. Mei Chen, because I was like, she's so good in this. What did she do after this film? Sure. Okay? She only is in five movies total. Really? On IMDb, at least? She's in one film in 1988. Okay. Then The Wedding Banquet five years later. Magic Sword the same year. 
May Jane, in which she plays the title character the following year. And then her Are final Are you looking film, at her IMDb page? Yes. Just to let you know, she's been in 200 movies. <laughs> Where are you looking? Uh, Wikipedia. It's just they, they don't put like every like foreign language film, like Taiwanese movie on there. Okay. Well then, so disregard everything I just said, but what I'm going to say next is still interesting. Go ahead. The last film they have listed for her here is called Woman Soup. Great, great title. That's interesting fact number one. She was in a movie called Woman Soup. And the fact there is there was a movie called Woman Soup. Oh, that's the whole fact? No, I have a better fact I'm getting to, oh, okay, but okay. I want to let people know that a movie called Woman Soup exists. And the plot synopsis is that it is a bunch of lonely women who go to hot springs together. It sounds, that's, that's, that's great. So they that's form a, a woman's soup. Woman soup. Yeah. That's fact one. Fact two, Mei Chen. Since 2001, Mei Chen has been a member of Taiwan's legislative body. And tell me to knew. stretch for time. Yeah. Right. One of three yeah. representatives of the island's aboriginal population. Her yes. small party is allied with the ruling pro-China Kuomintang. She once sued former Japanese prime minister uh, for visiting the controversial Yasukani Shrine to Japan's war debt. Um, great. And Ben is saying, stall for time. She was born September 21st. 1965. And Ben is saying, go longer. Well, the other thing that's interesting is she's a Mando pop star. Okay. Oh. And she quit acting not long after Wedding Banquet because she got liver cancer. She beat liver cancer, and then she was like, you know what? Fuck it. Politics next. Well, you know what's a good cure for woman cancer? Woman cancer? Well, now I, I mean, you know the joke I was going to make now. I was going to say liver cancer, and then I was going to say the cure was woman soup, and I've ruined everything. I mean, I, I would say. We had a perfect episode up until this point. <laughs> I would say that was the least successful chunk we've ever done on the show. It was bad. That's not true. That's not true. No, I mean, it's, um, it was really good. Yeah, thank you. That's accurate. Uh, you know, just I, listeners, Griffin's ego has gotten so massive after the tick that we're just having to like massage everything. What do you What do you got here? Uh, so, the wedding banquet, a great film by a great filmmaker. Mm -hmm. The wedding, yeah, the wedding banquet. Uh, you get this. This is a thing I like about this movie that I think speaks volumes. Okay. All of them just live in the house together. Yeah. Sure. Right. They okay. don't create that much of a, like, false narrative. They don't, like, Mrs. Doubtfire it. That's true. It's like, so the parents arrive, and Wei Tung is like, so here's my place, this is my roommate Simon, and here's my uh, girlfriend who I'm going to get married to. Right. And they're like, yeah, that all makes sense. We're from Taiwan. People all live in a house together. Some, you know, like, there's right. no, like, uh, um complicated scenes where it's like one guy's in one room and a door's being held closed or someone's on the phone and you're and, switching between lines. And or, like Simon's know. always at the table with them. Simon's always like involved in everything. They like Simon. His, his Mandarin is like decent so they're sort of okay. fond of that. Yeah. Like, Yeah, Simon's a pretty chill dude. They try to do this quickie City Hall marriage. Simon played by Mitchell Lichtenstein. Who then the went on to direct Teeth. He made teeth. You know what else, though? What? Teeth with a, what's Jess Wexler? Yes. Yeah. Um, he's the son of Roy Lichtenstein. I know that. The are. artist. Oh, cool. Isn't that crazy? I love that artist. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know. You know how I could tell? Because you watch the movie, when they zoom in on his face, it got a lot of little dots on it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're being chill, but I mean, like, this is a movie that comes out in 1993. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's not like some colossal hit but it made like 25 million bucks worldwide oh i'm sorry you want to talk about not some colossal hit okay here's an actual interesting fact okay mm -hmm. the wedding banquet trivia this was the most financially profitable film of 1993 earning 23.6 million for a budget of 1 million right gave it a cost to return ratio of 23.6 considerably higher than the that Jurassic Park. of Jurassic Park. <laughs> Fair. Um, yeah. And uh, Winston Chow, who played the lead role, had never been in, an, in a film before. He was an airline steward. That's crazy. Really? That's crazy. Yeah, a handsome airline good. steward. He's very handsome. He's very Let's handsome. Let's not beat around the bush. No, not at all. Um, no. I, I so, beat around his bush, you know what I'm saying? I guess so. A handsome bush. The parents are coming. He proposes this sham marriage to 
to uh, Wei Wei, played by Mei Chin. Mm-hmm. And yes, and then they have a city hall wedding. Now, I by the way, I've been to city hall weddings. They, I have as well. They, you know, they humble brag. It's <laughs> seriously yeah. that that's not city. Like they they made it look worse. Like they put it in like some drab office. They room. make it look like night court. And like they, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They make it look like everyone's waiting and Bunch watching the wedding. Like you can go in your wedding, own room their to have the wedding. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I still like that scene because again, the parents don't put up a fuss. Yeah, they're like. I guess we just grin and bear this. And then finally the mom just starts crying because it's so depressing. Like it is so antithetical to what she wants. I think a masterstroke of this film is that the parents are trying to understand the right. entire time. They're not, they are a roadblock in the way the tradition is a roadblock to his way of life. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Way of life. I mean, he's gay. He's but they're, they're not pointedly stubborn. They're not uh, like. Exactly. They're, it's all, we just get it. You yeah. get the traditions they want. Right. They're not dicks about it. No. And they're not going to force him to do anything. This isn't one of those annoying movies. And this is true of Eat Me, Drink, Man, yeah. Warm as well. Where it's like, well, you better do this or I'm pulling your money. Like, you know, where it's like there's right. some artificial conflict. Not at all. It's just he really wants their approval. So he's doing everything he thinks he needs to do. But also, and also you know, his dad's like a little frail because he had like a stroke. So it's like they're there's worried that wonderful about moment that, where he sees know. the dad in the chair and he gets worried for a second that his dad might have died. So he holds the finger under his nose to yeah. check the breath. And you kind of get that he realizes then he like goes like, we're getting married today. Yeah, he's, like, he's just like, like let I me just make you happy. Be married before my father passes. It could happen at any moment. Um, so then they go. Uh, his his boyfriend is like, look. This was a fucking disaster. Right. Let me book a reservation. Let's go get a nice lunch. Try to cheer them up. Right. And they get to the lunch, and it turns out the father of the owner of the restaurant right. served under the, uh, father. the father in the army. Right. And is like, do you understand who this fucking guy is? This guy's a hero. He saved my life. I owe him everything. What's going on here? And they're like, we just got married. We're not even doing a party. And he's like, nope. I'm making it up to you. Sumptuous banquet. Right. So this would be the bulk of... The dumber right. version then, of this movie. And then and it's not. I mean, it, it's it's one act. It's the middle. And it's fun. You I mean, I think it's great. Then I having love to that go scene. through these traditions. And it's not like the traditions are challenging. No, it's the tea ceremony. Lie. It's just like, like, do we have to do The thing with the blindfold it? where he has to guess who's kissing him and right. then he guesses a kid. Is she his guesses. Wife. She guess. Sorry. Yeah. She guesses the kid is the husband. Right. Yeah. And his friend makes the speech about like, well, we've known each other for a long time. I never even whoop, heard of this whoop, lady. Whoop, whoop. Is a, look, he's fried, and he holds up fried food, and it's a great joke, and everyone gives him comedy points. That's true. But this culminates in this weird tradition where they put them, they, they bombard their bedroom, right? Their hotel room. and Because then, she, like, accidentally opens the door, too. Right. Yeah. And everyone stands around, like, throws the cover on top of them, and is like, you have to keep on removing items of clothing. We won't leave until all your clothing is off. Weird. Yeah. I mean, but... These old, old, old fashioned wedding traditions are basically like, you got married, so you have to fuck to make babies. And I love that they don't You cut. might not know how. Right. I love that they don't. Step one nudity. Nudity. <laughs> not, not a prerequisite, but helpful. Yeah. It's kind of a prerequisite for me. Eh, a prerequisite. If we're going to get married, I want to tell you. I want to be naked when we have sex. Well, I think we might have found our first major <laughs> road. Oh, wow. Griffin's like, clothes on. Yeah. He's like wearing a coat. Yes. <laughs> I only have coated sex. Lights on with the coat on. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't want, jeez, boy, that's I want to see everything, but I want to expose nothing. <laughs> hey, if you're looking for a podcast to make you forget about everything else and actually just laugh out loud, you absolutely need to check out Dumb People Town. Yes, it's called Dumb People Town, and that's what it's about. Every week, the show celebrates and revels in dumb people around the world doing the dumbest things you can imagine, and plenty of things even the imagination can't create. Uh, it's hosted by comedy duo Jason and Randy Sklar, legends of podcasting. They've got comedian Daniel Van Kirk along for the ride. And honestly, it's the funniest new show I've heard in a long time. Every episode's packed with real news stories and constant ball busting between the hosts. And you feel their genuine awe for the stupidity inside of each of us. So you'll hear stories like about burglars boarding spaceships or threesomes on public patio decks and door-to-door meat salesmen. They've got special guests like Maria Bamford or Silicon Valley's Thomas Middleditch or John Hamm, Tig Notaro, Keegan-Michael Key. Trust me, you don't want to miss a single dumb moment, so just subscribe to Dumb People Town on iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts.
I love that they don't cut under the sheets. Sure. Like, to go like oh my God, what are we going to do? Right. Like, you're just seeing this mound underneath a cover, sure. surrounded by people, and they're just, like, very slowly throwing cl- items of clothing out. So it's right. funnier imagining how pissed off they are, not seeing their faces. Right. But then when everyone leaves, and they're like, woo, and now they're both naked in bed together, like, huddled up. Yeah. She she starts, she starts pushing hands, if you will. You know what I'm she saying? does. I mean, also, yeah. So a major subplot. I think the official term of what she does is push some hand onto ma- some body. Uh huh. A major subplot of what she of of this movie that I also like mm-hmm. is that she really likes the family. Yeah. And enjoys being part of the family. Like right. once they're all pretend living together. And she's had a run of bad relationships. They set up at the beginning, so it's like she's in something that's kind of stable right now, even if it's kind of phony baloney. Right. Like, they're not in love, but she's got a pretty good, like, home life now. Yeah. Um. And so I, I, I we've talked about it already. I just, I like all that stuff. I like where it's leading to. I do think that scene is clunky. I don't like that she it's grabs his penis, he says no, and then she goes, no, I'm having sex with you. Right. And, and then, then we they fade out. have sex to completion because she gets pregnant. Right. Uh, that's what I'm saying. It's like, finesse this better. This movie is written by Ang Lee and James Seamus, mm-hmm. who should mention, and Ted Hope. Uh-huh. I mean, no, uh, Neil Pang, sorry. Okay. Ted Hope produced it. Yes. But Seamus also co-wrote Pushing Hands with him. So yes. yeah, right from the start, those two are writing together. Mm-hmm. Ang Lee directs. Mm-hmm. Um... Let's see. Yeah, this is based on a real relationship, by the way. He said, I, I think yeah. the first act the, of the movie, the Neil basic Pang, setup, right. is based on a guy that Ang Lee knew. Um, Seamus said the first film was first written in Chinese, okay. translated into English, rewritten in English, translated back into Chinese, subtitled in Chinese and English in a dozen other languages. Like, it does seem like a complicated way to work. Right. It's, uh, it's not like one of those things where you read it. It's like, well, Aang and James, they just need each other because they're just like two halves of a whole. It's like, this seems so Byzantine, these these translations. And Ang Lee was like pointedly not super fluent English at this point. Like could speak, but I don't think was like fully bilingual. Uh huh. You know, because even by the time we get to Sense and Sensibility, they talk about the fact that like sometimes he had trouble explaining Communicating himself. to right. the actors. Yeah. Uh, but but somehow they they found themselves much like the characters of this film, strange be- bedfellows who found a, a, an interesting sideways existence that lended itself to happiness for all around them. So, is that a sentence? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So Weiwei gets knocked up. Here's one thing I like: Simon is mad because Wei Tung didn't use a condom because yeah. he's like, my whole fucking thing is act up. Fucking use a condom. Right. You want, you want to ha- have sex it's the with, 90s. with one lady for kicks. Fine with me. We'll figure it out. Vet it with me firsthand and also throw on a rubber for goodness sake. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but she gets pregnant yep. and they're now tense as shit. Everyone's right. flipping out around the breakfast Th- table. Then we, but then we, we kind of jump ahead in time at some point, right? Cause he has another stroke and they're like grounded. Yes. Like the the implication is the parents stay way longer than they but should. But there's that scene that's great where they're fighting in the morning and the right. parents presumably don't understand what's going on because they, they're they fighting just in English. They're fighting, right? Right. And, and they talked about it to each other in Mandarin. Right. And they start to put together, oh, it must be that she's pregnant. That's the only thing that could get you that angry. Right. They have the stroke, right? They go to the hospital. He's right. sitting outside the room with his mom and the mom puts it together. Right. She's pregnant and he thinks she's put together that he's gay. So he starts sort of like sideways coming out. Right. Like kind of backing his way into it until she says what she's saying and he just fucking owns up to it. He does. And he says, there's that line I love where he's like, so much joy, so much pain I haven't been able to share with you. Yeah. Like the idea that he hates, that he ha- hasn't been able to talk to her about the good stuff and the bad stuff. What a good move. So much of his life has been like hidden from her. So he owns up to it and she sort of like, you know, I don't get this. I don't love this. You're my son. Of course I love you. I accept you. You cannot tell your father. Right. Turns out who's around the corner listening. Right. Yeah. Big daddy. No. He's in the hospital bed. Who's around the corner listening? Wei Wei. Oh, right. And? Uh, Roy Lichtenstein. Yeah. Junior. So now they Mitchell. know that he told her. Yeah, I yeah I kind of forgot about this part. Yeah, okay. Because I right. like this web they build at the end of the movie where like everyone doesn't know what everyone else knows, but all of them have somehow come to some sort of understanding with someone else. Sure. Like they're all kind of cool with everything without knowing that everyone else is cool with everything. 
I just, yes. This is what I found so emotionally affecting at the end of the film. Is like there's this powder keg where they all kind of say goodbye to each other at the airport. So this is what made you cry. Or, or they're getting on a boat, right? Uh, I thought they were getting on a plane. I can't remember. For some reason I thought it was a boat. Yeah, I was yeah. also very tired. Yeah. I don't uh, think, why would they be getting on a plane? I have no idea. I, okay, I, so I'm wrong. All right. All right. They're pushing hands into the sky. That's uh-huh. the official term for Correct. taking yeah. a flight. Yeah. Samwise is watching them get off on a boat to the Grey Havens. The point is... No, it's a plane. Okay, so According to Wikipedia, okay, at least. so I'm losing my mind. You said I got my ego's out of control. I mean, think about it, Ben. Why would they be getting on a boat? Like, when you think about oh it. Oh, my God. What's this? Oh, you guys just won the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> for this episode. I ben, can't believe it. We have kept it to the time you asked. Yeah, yeah. We're going to play well, the box office game in a minute. We're bringing this ship into the harbor, so much like exactly. the boat at the end of Wedding Banquet. <laughs> Look, the point is they got this scene where they're saying goodbye and a thing that Ang Lee is very good at is repressed emotions, people who cannot express themselves, right? And so you have this thing where everyone's kind of nodding to each other. Everyone's trying not to cry right? and trying to like... And like the mom has basically sort of become a surrogate mother to Wei Wei. Like, right. you know, there's all, yes. Uh, Mr. Gao really likes Simon the dad. And he yeah. tells Simon that he knows. Yes. But that he, Simon can't tell them that he knows or that he speaks English. Right. So it's like this whole web of them just quietly like accepting each other. Right. I find that very, very affecting. Right. Because your family is a goddamn mess. <laughs> and my family's a mess. And they behave in this way where everyone knows like one thing about another person. but And some people share this information and others don't. And it's like a complicated web of like, well, who knows what about who and who knows that they know. Ben, cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> ben, double it. And then, of course, the film ends with the most emotional shot in history, a slow motion shot of a man raising his arms as he's about to be checked by the TSA for bombs. <laughs> yeah, fair. Get, getting the, the wand, the metal detector wand. This movie... The most profitable film of 1993 in terms of cost. Yeah, the Wikipedia also ratio. has that. I feel like they're they're making that bit too much of a brag. But this movie, a humble brand, came out in 1993. That's right, August 6th. You heard me before the theatrical release of Pushing Hands, as we were already established. It came out. It grossed Pushing Hands' entire domestic gross in one weekend, 134 thousand dollars. And what's its final domestic? Six point nine. Good. Seriously. So this is the summer when Jurassic Park's running the table. Adjusted for inflation, it made $15 million. Yes, good number. No, very good. Uh, yes, Jurassic Park, you have guessed it, is number five at the box office. Nine weeks in, it's made $300 million. That's right. You did it. You guessed number five at the box office. So let's go in reverse order. Whoop, up the charts. What's number four? It is a film that I saw in theaters. It was a big hit. Casper Spirit of Begin. Nope. It was a big hit. Oh, okay. Of this. Like, it was a somewhat surprising hit of this uh, year, I feel okay. like. Um, was it a kid's film? It's a kid's film. It's got I a mean, great so- original song. It does actually really dig this song. So good. Uh, yes, it has an official song by a big pop star of the moment. 1993, big pop song. It's, it's explicitly a kid's, movie, a kid's movie. Very much so. The song isn't sung by characters in the film. It's no, like a song it's from the over soundtrack. the credits. And uh, it has a title that English people think is hysterical. British people. Yes. Because it, it, in, in slang, slang, it means something completely different. Fanny and Alexander? <laughs> yeah, right. No. <laughs> Good guess. Movie about kids. Sure. Not really a kid's movie. Fanny means vagina. That's true. In England. Here it means your butt. Okay. Um, so it's it's got a title that British people find It is funny. true that English people think that Americans say the word fanny pack is very funny, though. Yeah. Like that is, English people do genuinely. It's like a vagina pack. How are you so privy to all this stuff that British people? Yeah, this think? is weird. Are you looking this up in that leather bound volume? Because that volume just says. <laughs> Can the leather bound volume be canon on this yeah, podcast? That now? volume just says Ang Lee. So, how would you know these other facts that shouldn't be contained within that volume? It's prior information that I have in my body and soul. But how would you possess that information? Because I grew Did up in England, it? you Whoa, fucking what? ingrate. <laughs> Get me out of here. Oh, boy. Oh. Okay, I threw my headphones down to the ground yeah, for he real. he may have broken them. I might have broken them. <laughs> 1993, it's a kid's film. It has a pop song in it. I did break these headphones. Did you really? Yeah, I did. Are you serious? 
It's a good bit. I full on broke. I mean, talk about bit commitment. I full on broke. Well, no, 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 no. I just dislodged it. I just dislodged it. It's not a big deal. I just dislodged it. No, I'm relodging. He got it. Thank you. He literally did that. It was very stupid of him. 1993. It's got a big pop song. Kids love it. British people guffaw. They do. They genuinely do. Animated or live action? Live action. Live action. Yeah. Uh, It's like one of those things where you're like, oh, like, right. We all went to see this movie. What was the final domestic 77, I think. You know, like a decent size. Yeah, 77. Adjusted. It, It had like, it had at least two theatrical sequels. Wow. That are like, I mean, ridiculous. Like, there's no way there should have been sequels to this movie. So it's very much like a one yeah, premise. The movie, movie ends with like he we, great. It's problem solved. Oh, oh! Did you see this movie, Ben? Of course, I saw great. the shit out of this movie. It's called Free Willy. It's called Free Willy, and they free him, and yet right two more times, and two more times. So like Willy's in trouble. I'm like he's in the fucking ocean. <laughs> he's fine. Leave him alone. Let him be, you monster. We can't solve every problem and, for know, Willy. That, At some point, he's got to solve some shit himself. Like poor Keiko, who like the the yeah. whale, who the killer whale becomes independently yeah. famous, right? And like had the dorsal fin was like floppy because that's like a sign of a whale in captivity. Yeah. And they keep like dragging her out to play, and you're like, leave the fucking whale she had alone. To do Leno and shit. Yeah, right. Uh, they also did an animated series. I, I vaguely remember that. I definitely saw this in theaters. I definitely saw Free Willy 2 in theaters. I think I might have skipped out on I uh, think Free so Willy too. 3. Um, anyway, just crazy to think about. Free Willy, the animated series is like he keeps on freeing Willy and Willy fights like aquatic robot villains. <laughs> hey, man, it was the 90s. <laughs> Jason James Richter, Lori Petty. Yeah. Or, you know, Michael Tank Madsen's the, yeah. the scumbum dad. Yeah, right? Michael Madsen, yeah. Jane Atkinson, August Schellenberg is in it. Okay. Uh, you know, the great Native American actor. Michael T. Williamson, like solid, solid. Oh, cast. and the the title's funny because it sounds like you're releasing a penis. Correct. That you're taking your penis out of your pants. Yeah, free Willy, that's what they called the Paul Rubens film. That probably was a joke that every yeah. talk show host made, right? Probably. Because he right. freed his willing. Number two is a film not directed by, but starring someone we talked about in the last box office game. A big hit of the year. Huge hit. Good so it's movie. A, it's a Gibson? No. What? But good guess. It's not directed by. Not directed by, but starring the director of a movie we talked about. And does he usually? He These days, he really just directs, and if he's in a movie, he probably directed Clint it. Eastwood. Correct. Directed by, but not starring. No, this movie oh, is opposite. starring but not directed by one of his rare like in this at this point he rarely doesn't but you know clear and present danger no oh, not 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 no, the but in the line in, of fire is in the, the line one of fire I confuse which those is a titles. good movie I really like that and movie. in a later episode I will con- to, uh, confuse the title yeah with Malkovich right. uh, Oscar, Oscar nominee yeah. as the villain fun movie yeah number two is a, a racist film against Asians. A, a certain a specific country actually but this is confusing once again because casper spirit of beginning <laughs> you ever seen this one bam no is racist it, is it it's uh i'm trying to remember the title it's the one with sean connery and wesley snipes that's right it's called rising sun that's right cool weird. uh weird yeah i don't know yeah uh, and number one when you think sensitive movie about asia you cast sean connery and wesley snipes <laughs> number one is I guess it wasn't the biggest. It was the the third biggest film of the year behind Jurassic Park and Mrs. Doubtfire. It is a great movie that I could watch every single day if I You had love to. it. Ben's nodding his head. I just watched it recently. Isn't it great? It's great. Isn't it's, it great? It's like a, a perfect, like, it's on HBO in the middle of the day movie. Exactly. It's a high-grossing 93 film. Yes, it's opening this weekend to $23 million, which what is 93 it? is great. What does it end up at? $183 million. <sighs> Which uh, adjusted for inflation, my friend, is a healthy four hundred and seven million dollars. Uh, is a kind of a family film. No, it's an action film. It's an act. It's a pure action film. Very much so. From nineteen ninety, I'm pretty sure it's rated R. Three rated R. Does it no? Start? Apparently, it's PG thirteen. Wow. Does it start? It's kind of violent for a PG thirteen. Does it start a big action star? Yes. Like a canonical big action star. A canonical huge star. Who is in action movies, but he's also in other movies. Schwartzy? No. Nope. Stallone? No. Nope. Think, like, better. 40? Harrison? 1993. That's right. It's Free Willy Harrison 2. Ford picture called The Fugitive. Yeah. 
I did think that was R rated as well. Yeah, because that the murder scene of his wife is that's I feel like that's pushing into our territory. That's that's rough. But he did not murder her. Uh, yeah, he did not murder her. But was uh, that ever clear? Did he ever? He would just say it. Yeah. Honestly, they could have saved themselves a lot care. of foot traffic. Yeah. I didn't kill my wife. <laughs> I, didn't I don't kill care. my wife. I didn't kill my wife. I didn't kill my. You switch the samples. I didn't kill my wife. Um, yeah, we also got the firm, uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights, which is funny. Yeah. Dave Chappelle's in it. Yeah. Uh, the Meteor Man. The Meteor Man, which I saw in theaters because I was like, here is a PG rated movie. Superhero. About a superhero. Yeah. I've never heard of the Meteor Man. Yeah. And it's like, I think it just went. I, I remember thinking it was fine, but like I think it went all over my head. This like sure. Robert Townsend movie about like reclaiming like superheroism and like the community and like yeah. uh but that's a good movie. Do you know that he made like another superhero comedy for the Disney Channel? No. I think Robert Townsend directed a film called Up Up and Away. That's yeah. like a live action Incredibles type I had no idea. suburban superhero family movie. Uh you're right. Yes, Bronze Eagle he plays. In up, that up movie and away um yeah but i mean uh robert townsend man he was uh he was a part was, of my youth he was a big deal for a while yeah yeah uh apologies to ang lee for the previous 90 minutes uh, every single second of it we're so sorry I just get ready until we hulk the hulk you're though. a wonderful director and we're very excited to talk about your movies Seem like a kind man next week we're going to talk about each drink man woman i believe that episode's a little more respectful uh yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Remember that one being a little more sort of academic about his uh, his yeah. filmmaking. Uh, yeah. The great Allison Willimore joins us. That's right. We still Turning have to guest. do the ad, so we'll see how those. Yeah, right. Out. Maybe we'll fuck it up there. Yeah, <laughs> we'll hey, really hey, take the hey, whole thing. Hey, language. <laughs> this has been a so respectable sorry. podcast so, so far. So sorry. Yeah, didn't you talk about like brown buttholes like two minutes into this thing? I talked about the brown eyes, Sarah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Please do. Thanks to Lee Montgomery for our theme song and for Guto for our social media, Joe Bowen and Pat Reynolds for our artwork. Go to blankies.red.com for some real nerdy shit. And as always, they get on a boat at the end of the wedding bank. <laughs> shit. Perfect app. Do it.